Hi everyone. So today for the podcast we have Rafael Gomez. He is an educator, a designer, and he is my previous head of department and lecturer at QUT. And he's honestly a truly inspirational person and he's the kind of person who could teach anyone, even if you're not interested in design, to enjoy design and appreciate it. So I hope you enjoy the podcast and if you enjoy it, please subscribe as I'm trying to get this podcast going and try to get my subscribers up as much as I can um, so I can try and take this podcast to the next level. So yeah, thank you for coming along for the ride and I hope you enjoy. When I look back on my degree with RAF, the most memorable moments were the educators such as yourself who were truly passionate about the teaching and about design. Do you find your role as an educator truly rewarding? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, Roman. Uh, It's a fantastic initiative that you're running. Um, As you said, I've I've been at QUT for for many years. I've I've taught, um, I've been teaching industrial design there uh, pretty much since I graduated. and to be honest, it wasn't initially what I wanted to do in mm. my life, in my career. Um, but once I got into it, I loved it. Um, I truly, truly love what I do. Um, there's many elements of the job, just like any job, that are difficult and challenging. And, you know, they're not, they're not, not everything is outstanding. But generally speaking, I wake up and I am... Um, you know, I have a smile on my face thinking about um, whether it's teaching, whether it's a research side of things, whether it's working with companies um, on on projects, whether they be research projects or teaching and learning projects that we embed into the course and the curriculum. All of those different elements that we do as academics, I, I really, really enjoy. Um, mm. So the short answer and the long answer is yes. Um, I, I re- I'm really passionate about, about teaching. That's great. Just a bit of background, Raf was a lecturer of my capstone subject and other subjects around my degree at Queensland University of Technology. And I believe I can speak for my peers when I say that his teaching sits at the pinnacle of design education. And we spoke about you on the first (laughs) podcast, actually, and we were saying um, that basically, like, academics like yourself, they really lead the way and make you feel passionate about wanting to learn, which I think is like almost the most important part of education, if not the most important part. Because often, like, you can be learning about something that's very interesting, but if you have the wrong teaching style for you and the, the teacher doesn't seem passionate about it, it's very hard to get committed to it. And, yeah, I think that's, like, really where um, design teachers specifically excel. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that um, I think is important from an educator's perspective, um, and I don't know if you want to go down this track, but but I want to kind of unpack that just a little bit, is... Um, when I was going through uni, um, firstly, I love design and there's, you know, a lot of the students in final year, they're there because they enjoy some aspect of design that they're doing. Um, and one of the things I was thinking is if I were ever taught, you know, if I'm ever a teacher, even though that wasn't really where I was heading down, but if I'm ever going to teach, I said, I have to still know enough about design to feel honest and truthful about what I'm teaching to students. Mm. Um, so that was number one thing for me was I have to keep my foot in the field Um, because unlike other fields design is there is a very strong and a a very important theoretical element to what we do there's a there's a theory side of design but it connects really strongly with the practice side of design Mm -hmm. and and design is about doing it's about making it's about being in the world and 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 affecting people right positively Um, and so you have to you know, that that's one thing I, I told myself early on in my career was I have to continue working with, you know, industry, with with real world projects, with with real clients, um, which I've continued to do. I've been lucky enough to kind of continue that. Um, and of course, you know, with some of the research stuff that we do with BMW and others. Um, the second part of it is uh, my role as an educator, and I think the role of any educator is to to help the students inspire, uh, find inspiration in themselves. Mm. So uh, I say, in, I was going to say inspire themselves, but the, the inspiration is there, but you've got to tap into it and then help them realize what that is mm. and let that, let that, that flow on that. Because if, if I can do that for the student, it's just unlock that box that's in there that they already have a passion for design, but mm. you know, the pieces quite aren't quite there yet. If I can put that there, then my job is so easy as an educator mm. because I'm no longer pushing anyone to do anything. All I'm doing is 
giving advice, right? Because they're pushing themselves. Um, and and that's a really important part of it is, is even though I'm, we're teaching content and we're teaching skills and techniques and, and stuff that's going to be valuable in your career, really all I'm, I think fundamentally all I need to do as an educator is unlock that box that where you go, that, that inspiration flourishes. And then my job is so easy after that point. It's actually really rewarding because I start talking yeah. to, you know, like I did with you and your capstone project is we start chatting about, uh, I don't have to sit there and go, oh, you know, like keep going and trying to force you to do stuff. You were just doing it. I, you were just going, hey, Raph, what about this? What about that? And now I'm just guiding you down that mm. path, right, yeah. that you are already taking. Um, so, yeah, those two things are really important as an educator. Mm, definitely. Uh, in terms of the where you've been in the past, what kind of projects or organizations have you been a part of and how has that impacted your role as an educator? So I've worked um, because of, as I told you, I, I was really strict with myself saying I need to st stay in industry and, and keep doing work in the industry. I worked for um, an in-house design team. So I've worked at a company that made their own products. Mm. I've worked for consultancies where, you know, it's it's different. It's, it's working for many different clients, to work in all sorts of different projects. Um, I've run a business uh, with a, by myself, personally. Um, I run a business, a very <laughs> unprofessional and very small business initially. Um, but after after I graduated, I started a, a more professional business consultancy with a colleague um, who had finished industrial design with me we started a business and then another person joined um, I then left that business after nine years but I did run, run a consultancy as well um, through that period and in all those different jobs um, I've worked for small micro businesses medium-sized businesses and large corporations like Virgin Australia we did projects for Virgin um, and, and other big kind of corporates um, in medical health field, in in the uh, electronics consumer field, in um, signage, um, yeah, various kind of projects. Um, and the 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 most I ever did, I think, um, in one place out of all of those jobs was my consultancy that I ran for nine years um, mm. with a colleague. In the other ones, um, the one with consultancy was was shorter time, a couple of years, and the one with in house was, um, yeah, about two years as well, two or three mm. years. Okay. Yeah. To what degree have you observed industrial design education evolving over the years? Education changes in certain ways, but it also stays the same in other ways. Mm. Um, the 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 way that industrial design and design is taught in most places around the world, the kind of golden standard was set probably in the early 1900s, so the mm -hmm. early 20th century, um, uh, with uh, the Bauhaus kind Bauhaus of style style. of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, that's impacted and, and, and of course it's, it's, as I say, some things just continue evolving. They changed mm -hmm. like the technologies we use and, and you know the, the 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 concept of a studio, um, the idea in the Bauhaus was still when it, when it was initiated was still a kind of master apprentice approach. Mm. We have we still have some remnants of those things, you yeah. know, where we lecture in theater halls. I mean, that's a master apprentice approach. It's like I'm the master. Listen to me. Here, I'm going to impart some information. Learn from my information, right? Mm. But we also have that this this kind of really important studio aspect to what we do. Mm. Um, which again was set in the Bauhaus, which is, oh, actually, you can't just learn everything by listening to me. You have to do some of it yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah. here's a studio, here's a space for you to actually enact yeah. that knowledge. Um, the Bauhaus so, um, principles have been mentioned in a few podcasts now, specifically um, Anton yeah. was talking about it the other day and he was saying how it really it really affected him. Maybe if you could give a bit of a summary for anyone who doesn't isn't familiar with Bauhaus principles, just of what Bauhaus education entails of. Because I think it's something that like we keep mentioning, but there's no no like to some people they probably be like, what is Bauhaus or what is Bauhaus education specifically? It might be a hard one. <laughs> it's it's a it's not hard. Well, it is hard, but it's really complex. It's a really complex yeah. history. Um, but look, this is very. It's going to be very imperfect, but I'll try and give a summary here. 
Um, the Bauhaus started off in different places around the world in a in similar time. There is a core group of people in um, in Europe that kind of initiated, especially in Germany. Um, uh, there was, you know, lots. Some of these people then travelled to and joined other people in the UK, in 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 uh, in London and in in the UK, where there was like an uprising of some of this, and also went over of course, because of the war and political issues, went over to the US and really impacted US. And there was a kind of a, a second golden era in the US at that time. But that was a little bit later. Mm. But the Bauhaus started as a as a kind of reaction to the two, two things. And again, this is really imperfect. But two things. One is the Victorian era kind of style of craft manufacturing, craft creation of I'm an artist and I'm going to create stuff using my hands and I'm going to teach a, 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 a team of crafts people to do this. Mm. And there's this kind of superfluous aesthetic to the things because mm. it comes from an old tradition of crafting, of art, of, you know, presenting these things to, to kind of like the royalty, you mm. know, although yeah. it was, it was not royalty as such anymore in, in its strict sense, they were still they were producing things for the everyday person. Mm. There was still this kind of holding on to we're crafting for the rich and the wealthy. So there's all this craft and art and there's my imprint on this product, right? Mm. As, as a craftsperson. Um Bauhaus and, and the concepts and the underlying philosophy of Bauhaus was a was a reaction against that, said, no, there is a beauty and an aesthetic that comes with mass manufacturing so that was the second aspect mm. of, of the Bauhaus was they absorbed the concept and 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 ran away with the concept of kind of mass manufacturing that was picking up it, it was established but was mm. picking up now in in the product area not just in the kind of big kind of uh, manufacturing sector but also yeah. in the product design area mm. and and there was a certain aesthetic about it it was like it was getting rid of all the superfluous things. It was mm -hmm. like simple and geometric and, you know, using the technology of manufacturing and that there's this beauty and aesthetic to it. And so it started as this kind of reaction to that um, where uh, leaving the kind of art craft and moving into this more objective, this mm -hmm. concept of an objective aesthetic, right, which is, superfluous of me as an artist or as a designer it doesn't have to be about me mm. it's more now about how do we design it for anyone to use the democratization mm. of design right so that anyone can access it we can make it cheaply and beautiful and mm. functional and, and all of that and you know the concept of form follows function and all yep. of that um and and Bauhaus look the, the the original leaders of it in Germany were many of them were from the architecture mm. field so the architect and the arch architecture became like the pinnacle of what they did. And everything sat underneath that, including industrial design, including mm. landscape, including all sorts of design fields. Um, but that's another kind of, but you'll see it. The reason I mentioned that is you'll see the concepts of Bauhaus still impacting us today mm. in terms of architecture, in terms of building design, in terms of houses, in terms of, even concepts of you know the the products and things that that were around, it's impacted that from that period on. I mean, yeah. it's still around and it's still incredibly strong, um, uh, even though it's evolved and formed and morphed. And there's been other things that have evolved as a reaction against the Bauhaus concepts yeah. as well. You know, the simplicity and the the, the kind of uh, the minimalist approach that Bauhaus sometimes took. That is the interesting thing yeah. about modern design i suppose you look you look at designs and like initially it may seem like a completely you know modern futuristic almost concept but then if you actually look at it you know there's a lot of foundational information uh, visual information in it that dates back to all these previous concepts yeah i mean look up um some of the work that william morris and some you know they were craft so these these people weren't even in the full like minimalist mode they were mm. still in the craft mode but they liked the aesthetic of the kind of the manufactured aesthetic and they brought that into what they did as craft people um 
yeah, Morris and um, Macintosh and um, uh, Eileen Gray, um, you know, the um, uh, Eames, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ray and Charles Eames, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's just their stuff, you know, was kind of late 1800s, early 1900s. Some of that is mid 1900s, mm-hmm. but some of it is late 1800s. And it, you look at it and you're like, Holy crap! Like I can buy that from Alessi today, yeah. and it's still like it looks cutting edge, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting seeing some mm. of that, and especially when students in design or art learn about that and see those images mm. and be like, "Wow!" Like, you know, like we're still here, like we're still the- there. In some of our aesthetics and 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 function, form, and style. Um, mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. We were talking about that with Anton about how basically currently there's this big inspiration of Pinterest and people are kind of replicating the same kind of visual concepts over and over because we're just constantly absorbing the same information from the algorithm online. And like, we were talking about the importance of going back and actually like looking at the history of, 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 you know, all the way back to the beginning of time and like drawing parts from history and like implementing that instead of what's just going to be regurgitated to you through the algorithm. Is that something that you definitely subscribe to? A hundred percent. Um, one of the things that I think all design schools try and do, and some mm. do better than others, is teach students about the history of design. Mm. And, you know, as a student, and I was exactly the same, but as a student, I used to think, oh, God, what do I need to learn about history? I want to get a job like when I graduate, right? Mm. Uh, teach me the skills that I need for those jobs. Um As an educator, one of the things we're trying to do when we think about it more broadly in a big picture view is trying to teach you not for your job once you graduate, like the year out once you graduate, but for when you as a designer, as a person, as a professional, are making the decisions 10 years down the track in your career about what to spend money on, what to do with, you know, your mindset about those things. Mm. Um, when you have the opportunity to actually make decisions about spending money, resources, hiring people, looking for, you know, who you collaborate with and doing all that stuff. I'm trying to teach you the right mindset for when you're there, mm. right? 10 years down the track. And part of that is understanding history. Yeah. Understanding where we've been, what's happened, what's been done, how people have achieved amazing things in history so that you can start to make those those correct decisions down the track. Mm. Of course, you know, t- teaching you the techniques and the, the, the stuff is important. We mm. know that students and people need jobs coming out of university. So that's really important. But if that's all we did, then we'd be a TAFE, right? Yeah. It'd be like a, a, a technical course that, 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 that we teach. So when people talk about... Um, you know, you're, you're touching on a really important point about history and understanding all of that. It's really, really crucial, especially mm. later on for your career as a professional, is you, you've got then a library and understanding. You may not remember everything about the mm. history of design, but you have like, you have a mental model, you mm. know, a rough mental model of things. And you can go, oh, I need to go learn a little bit more about that. Or I remember, you know, Ray and Charles Eames looking at, you know, bent, you know, st- bent wood, steam chairs and designs that they did because that was a new technology at the time mm. and they created a whole new aesthetic based on this technique of steaming and bending wood that mm. was not existing before um and 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 bent steel as well you know that the pipe the pipe steel that that they, they started to create and 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 generate a whole new aesthetic based on mm. a new technique of manufacturing understanding those things is like really critical you know yeah. um and, and we're in a time right now talking about the algorithm. We're in a time right now where like things like, you know, the art of the AI and the, the, the DALI that you can generate all sorts of concepts and stuff. There's a certain aesthetic mm. that, that now is generating and creating. Yeah. And we're going to be, I think, we're going to go through this period where there's going to be products, designs, mm. ideas, and concepts based off that aesthetic. Mm. And it will become part of the, you know, thousands of aesthetic types that we've had and styles mm. that we've had in, in, in our, you know, in our kind of history. Um, so it's going to impact it in a, in a big way. Um, and, and yes, I think there is a massive impact that's going on where, but that's normal, you know, there's mm. trends and there's styles and, and, and students will, 
seek those out and then try and do stuff that's kind of trending, you know, mm. yeah. as part of what they do. That, that's completely normal. Um, but understanding the history and what this means in the terms of, you know, what's happened before and all of that is, is really, really critical. Yeah. yeah. What catalyst do you believe is the most instrumental in this evolution of design education? What catalyst? Um, what do you mean with by catalyst? Specifically, there? like, I don't want to give you the answer, but like, could be, could be anything. Could be technology. It could be, um, you know, the change of okay. environment. It could be the change of culture, social, you know, aspects. It could be anything. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a that's a tricky question. I'm bringing up because... questions already. <laughs> but it's it's a good one it's a good one um because it forces someone like me to kind of <laughs> to give you an answer it forces me to think about all the things that i think about on a daily basis and give you give you something so so here's my attempt i think that the, the biggest catalyst the biggest change that's going to happen this century for me in design and this is just an inkling seeing the things that i see as a researcher things that i see with you know uh, uh, we work with BMW and the projects that we see there with a multinational corporate. Um, through that, we see work that Microsoft is doing, that NVIDIA is doing. These are cutting edge, you know, companies that are mm. doing really cutting edge work. I think there's a few things, um, but the biggest catalyst is artificial intelligence, but not in the way that I was just talking about it before of like generating art and design and stuff mm. and not in the way that I, that are, uh, AI in terms of like, not necessarily software AI, not not interactive AI, mm. right? So I'm not talking about that either, like robotics or software or or things like that. The, the the sci-fi version of AI that we think about. What I mean by AI is the what it's going to allow us to do, whether it's the right algorithm, the right AI, or the right computing power. So when those things kind of combine and meet we're going to be able to start to see the world in a much more sophisticated and complex way than we've ever seen it before. Mm. So the things like, um, you know, the big topics around the environment, sustainability, um, um, social problems like poverty, inequality, um, the use of resources around the world and all those things, right? We have, obviously, if you just, let me explain it this way. If you just think about like the human brain by itself and what we can compute in our human brain, mm. there's certain things that we can compute that are really, that are more sophisticated than computers. But things like systems and understanding systems, say, I, I will I'll tell you, oh, can you tell me, how you know the global manufacturing system works around mm. the world like it works right we know it works mm. we we live it but there is not one human who can really actually mm. fathom it fathom Even what like it's internet. like internet's a good one it's like so hard to fathom how the internet works on a global scale and like it legitimately right? works yeah. in such a in such a i don't know analog way like there's cables that run under the ocean it's just wild when you think about it like that. Like we're living in the future and we're still running cables under the ocean to get into it. It's just crazy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I this concept of systems and how systems work and the universe is made up of systems and subsystems, right? But the concept of how systems work and how we impact systems as human beings, like the, the ecosystem, the environment, which is the problem we're dealing with, is we're, we're butting up against... Um, this issue of we impact these kinds of systems, but we don't even understand them because they are mm. so complex. They are so beyond what we can actually grasp in our brain. Mm. Right. So we use external things like computers, like pen and paper, like mm. mathematics, like we use external things to kind of understand them, compute them and, and manage them. Right. Mm. But, but even to this day, even our computing systems are limited. So, what I mean by AI is once we get the right computational power with the right artificial intelligence to assist us with the right kind of tools and, and things, um, and we can start to visualize how those systems are working in a real-time basis, mm. right? Now we're getting to a higher level of understanding, mm. right? 
about how the world works, about how we live in this world and how we're impacting the, the, the world and other big problems that we have. So for me, all of the problems that we have in the world that we're trying to solve in the 21st century, like inequality, like poverty, like, you know, um, the, the, the environmental problems, which cause all sorts of other complex problems. Mm. Um, <clears throat> they're going to be, we're going to be able to tackle them at a much, much better way once we put our mind and our technology towards solving those things. Mm. So for me, those that's the most critical catalyst. And then designers, what our role in that in that space is, no matter how sophisticated the AI is, it's going to be up to us to determine AI and all of these these tools will allow us to see those things and visualize them and mm. understand them in, in all sorts of intricate ways. Mm. But it's going to be up to humans to say, what do we value as humans? Where do we want input? Is it over here or is it over here? And the repercussions of those inputs, right? So like unbeknownst to us, for instance, you know, like the the the, the digging up, you know, um, coal over in, in Australia or, um, you know, minerals in Africa is impacting, you know, poverty over here somewhere mm. in the other side of the world. How those things happen, we have very, very little understanding of mm. how that works, right? We know it happens, but but we just see traces of it. Mm. And once we see those things, we'll start to go, oh, crap, it's probably not good to do this thing over here because it's going to impact this thing over here, Yeah. right? Um, and that's what I think AI... And, and and advanced computation and algorithms are going to help us to do much much better mm. and it's actually going to raise the 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 kind of what we do as humans to mm. another level yeah and the basic stuff of like working at factories and doing things that really humans are not great at doing anyway mm. like we're not really good at doing those things will be done by the things that we create the robots yeah. and the other things and i'm not for going towards that i'm not saying that i'm for robots and stuff i'm not i'm not like a technologist and but if we were to say what's our next step that's a very plausible mm. you know thing that will happen to humanity it's necessary in my, in my view yeah but uh, yeah i'm not saying that it should or that it will mm. but if we if i was to write like a a plausible kind of you know future mm. that's a very plausible future you know, where we don't do the mundane things anymore. We've got stuff, robots and things to do that. We actually have elevated beyond that, mm. you know. Um, yeah, I mean, humanity has done that throughout history. You know, mm. we've gone from different stages to higher stages of, of you know, evolution, so to speak, and higher order things, higher order thinking and higher order actions in the world. I suppose this would come back to... Um you know, obviously there's a lot of people who are in those spaces that would lose their jobs to robotics, but I suppose that comes in like the amount of money that would be saved from implementing robots and things like that. Like that should be kind of a foundation for an income for people who have lost their jobs in like a neat and in a time when they need to, you know, find a new skill that's going to be more appropriate to the future. And I suppose like, yeah, it's more of like yeah, a I mean, redistribution of wealth kind of thing at that point. So yes, there's two levels to think about this, right? Mm. In the big picture view, losing like menial labor jobs is neither here nor there. No mm. one wants to do like if you were to ask someone, "Hey, do you want to push around an engine in a factory so you can put it in a car?" Mm. No one in their right mind would go, "Yeah, that's my dream," you know, like aspiration as a human mm. being. No, but of course, that's at a, at a very high level, right? Mm. That's an easy solution at a very high level. At a very practical level, people need jobs and work. And there's going to be a point of transition from having a factory job to not having a factory job yeah. and you lose your job and you need to use your income and you need to feed your family and the very practical things. Right. So in answer to your question, yes, there is a, there's got to be a careful redistribution of, of work, of, of, of economy, the, the economy has to shift and mm -hmm. change, you know, and, and re gear to, to, to elevate people to different roles and different jobs so at a very practical level, that's exactly what needs to happen. And and I think the economy needs to change as well. Like there's very fundamental things about the economy need to shift. Mm. But in the long-term broad picture, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. Mm. It's like saying, you know, we have machines now that do, like the car. The, the, there was a time when 
you know, animals did the the power of mm. moving us around. There was a time when we didn't have animals to move us around. We would go and walk with our own power. Mm. We've evolved from that, right? Yeah. Like we've, of course, we still walk, and but we have machines to do things that we, you know, that people used to do before. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we, we've always evolved out of things if we continue moving forward, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah, in the bigger picture, it, it's neither here nor there. Mm. Okay. I'm interested to hear as to what led you to pursue an educational role in design. Um, the I always wanted to work in the automotive industry, not necessarily in the styling automotive, but in the innovation side of, of, of automotive. I, I love cars. My dad really liked cars. He was a he was an engineer, um, civil engineer, so didn't actually work in the engineering, the mechanical engineering. And, but I think he, he gave me a passion because he liked to tinker with cars and mm. he was mechanically minded. He should have been an industrial designer, I, I should say, um, but he, he, never, he never was. It wasn't a career in El Salvador where, where he was born. Um, but I think it was in my final year, my supervisor... Um, many of the people who might be listening from XQUT people who might be listening know Vesna. Um, you probably don't know her, but many of, lots of people who have gone through QUT would. Um, Vesna offered me an opportunity to do a master's or a PhD. And it was a very good opportunity. She kind of just gave me the scholarship on mm -hmm. a plate. And I was like, um, I could still work and still do PhD or a master's. I started with a master's and I said, I can still work. And I did, I still worked and I did that part-time with a, with a consultancy while also doing a master's. So I thought I'm, I'm achieving two things and mm. it gives me a backup, right? When I started doing a master's, um, they, the QUT colleagues, so Vesna, Andrew Scott and stuff said, um, do you want to take over one of the units? Um, it's an old unit called product usability. And I was like, um, yeah, a bit of extra cash. Yeah, okay, let's let's see how we go. Um, and surprisingly, I just loved it. Mm. I loved teaching. I, I enjoyed it. It actually made, I felt like I was a better designer because mm. I, I had to really think deeply about what I was doing as a designer. Mm. Um, not just from a technical perspective, but also from like a cognitive perspective. Mm. Like, why am I doing what am I doing, right? Um, it, it challenged me as a as a designer. So when I was teaching, I was learning more about myself. And then when I was practicing, I was going, oh, wow, this is also really helpful for my teaching because I'm learning new stuff, right, mm -hmm. that I can bring into the classroom. Um, so little by little, as I did my master's, I then did a PhD after that as well. Um, little by little, as I started teaching, I realized, you know what, I can work and do innovative stuff with any company. I don't have to work for a company and be stuck there. I can work with any company if I'm at a university, right? Mm. I can actually engage with anyone, um, almost basically. Um, and, um, you know, the, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And the lifestyle as an academic is really good in terms of like, I'm my own boss. Yeah. Right. Like, um, uh, I, I really like that. I, I always wanted to work for myself. Um, even though, like I said, I wanted to work for a big, conglomerate that was a kind of like a vision and i realized i could just achieve all of those things plus have the flexibility mm. um for lots of other things working as an academic that's great yeah i um i won't mention specific name but um i spoke to a academic a long time ago a couple, a couple of years ago and they mentioned that they felt like if you're looking to go into a successful industrial design career you shouldn't necessarily go down an educational path as it can hinder your the way you're perceived as a designer obviously like in your case i feel like that's definitely not the case but do you have any is that does that have any merit or do you think that's not really the way you should sit um no i think that has a lot of merit um i don't think that's the way you should automatically see it mm. um anyone should automatically assume that just because someone's teaching they can't design that's really un that's that's mm. painfully untrue yeah. Actually, a lot of the academics I know are amazing designers. Yeah. Um, but certainly there are academics who have very little knowledge about the practice of design. They yeah. are 
truly like what I call like theoretical academics. Mm. Um, and but they play. There's an important role that they play mm. in the in the world of design, mm. right? There is a whole, especially if you go to Europe and North America, the the kind of the, the difference between like an academic and a and a designer. It, it, they they still understand that they have different roles to play in their careers mm. and stuff, but but the the segregation is not as 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 like clear mm. here in Australia. There is a lot of like camps, like mm. there's the academic camp and there's a the practice camp, and then there's like a few people who mingle intermingle between them. Mm. And that's the the space I like to do, right? Like I like to play. Um, but but look, there's a there's a really important role that academics play mm. in the world of design. Yeah. Um, just like the practicing designers, obviously, I mean that's where most people want to go as a designer. Mm. They have a, a critical role to play in the in the field of design. Um, but but so yes, in some ways, it is it is true that there are. I don't think going into academia will help your prof your professional career, especially in Australia and in mm. Asia going into academia doesn't necessarily help your practicing career in, in industrial design. Mm. Um, I think it, it can, it can, if anything, it can, um, it can uh, slow it down, you know, mm. like slow it down for you. Um, but, but that's, that, that comes back to the individual, mm. you know, the individual and how they define and, and, and progress their career. Um, whereas, um, in Europe and North America, that's not necessarily the case. Mm. They have a much more mature uh, design mm. field. The, 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 these some of the issues we're kind of grappling in Australia around the the the, the merging and the the good interaction between a, 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 academia and theory and practice and all of those things that's been resolved in Europe and North yeah. America. Like, there's still problems, but they had that argument a long time ago kind yeah. of thing um so yeah it, it depends where you go um yeah. so there is some truth to that comment but it's not necessarily always the case hmm. have you observed exponential growth in the capacity of graduate designers yes yeah um uh, i'm excited for various reasons it's it's sometimes scary thinking about like some of the skills that students don't have mm. <laughs> to be honest but also i'm excited about some of the things they they display through their course mm. um that even students 10 years ago didn't display yeah. um so i'll talk about maybe some of the positives first and then finish off with some of the negatives which may not even be that big of a deal so the, the positives i think are things like um there's a real genuine that i see anyway a real genuine concern from recent students about things like the environment sustainability mm. health you know human health and 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 things like that um like almost almost to a student they it, they all want to do something to improve the world in some way and have a very good understanding of what things improve and what things don't improve. It's in like avoid projects that are just, you know, like for the sake of making another product, mm. right? Like exactly. they, they actively avoid those things. For me, as someone who cares about like a, a career in design for someone's career and trajectory, that's such a good sign because I'm like, hopefully that stays with them because in 10 years, 15 years down the track, we're going to be in a better world because these mm. designers are going to be making decisions that are hopefully better than people before them. Right. Um, so that the, 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 the kind of understanding of emerging technologies and, and, and the utilization of emerging technologies and, and like finding information about things, how fast mm. students can find information about things um, and how, it, that that's just normal for for them. Um, I, I know it sounds very menial, very kind of um, not not really important, but it actually is really important to mm. know how to find information. Um, one thing which I think is really important is 
not just finding information, but finding good information. Mm. So there's, you can find lots of information, but 99% of it's crap. There's a 1% that's really good and you mm. need to know how to find that 1%. Mm. That's a harder, that's a tricky bit. And some students are really good at it, some are not. Mm. Right? They, they just grab the first thing they find. So, um, but the, the act of, of, of being able to find information and absorb it and utilize it and deploy it, mm. I, 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 I see that as a positive thing in terms of like, as a designer, you need to be really good at doing that, I mm. think, um, because you'll be doing that for the rest of your life. That's what we are in design is every project is kind of a learning curve. So mm. you're learning something new about something, right, when you're doing a project. Um, those are a lot of the really good things. Um, technology, um, the, you know, caring, having kind of an ethical or moral compass to what you do is is really important. Um, there's certain things like um, kind of attention span mm. is, is really interesting. That's, that's, I think, degraded over time. Mm. But as I said, I don't know how that's going to play out. Maybe that's not going to be an important thing in the future where you have access to so much and having, you know, attention and, and patience to do things slowly is maybe an old thing. Do you know what I mean? Because of the technology and the things we had mm. um, where you had to have patience and, 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 you know, to, to, to find what you wanted to. And, and, and um, that's maybe, maybe the new technique to find mm. things and do things better is to be more energetic about what you do. Right. Mm. Um, the other thing, which I think is, probably not even as important is like writing skills and some, mm. like these are basic things that um you know I'm, i think about chat gpt it's like how important is writing going to be in the future yeah i don't know like it's, you can just get um, it to write you an amazingly good sounding document right there the... yeah and then like why, why do i have to why do we have to teach people to i mean obviously there's basics that you need to learn so that you can determine what's a good piece of writing and what's a bad piece of writing mm. but but the actual act of sitting there and like crafting a report and understanding you know like lead sentences and like joining sentences and conjoining paragraphs and you know flagging things if a program can do that for you why who cares mm. like do you know what i mean um yeah. so it's an interesting kind of you know, maybe the reason why students are coming with less of that skill is because it's been resolved by something else that they have, some other mm -hmm. tool that they have available to them. It's, so, it's also just probably a change in like the the way of life. Like if you look back into even nineteen hundred, early nineteen hundreds, eighteen hundreds, even better. Like basically for the last like five hundred years, our language has just got more and more simplified to the point where like you could easily say that it's worse, but it's also better because it's more condensed. Like you know what I mean? Like when you, when you look back at old, old forms of writing, you're like, wow, this writing is amazing. How could people write so intelligently? And, you know, just, uh, they could articulate what they're trying to say in such an amazing way. But now like where, where our writing is very different and arguably worse, but I mean, yeah, I suppose you can argue either way at that point. Yeah. You know, with honestly, with the advent of things like chat GPT and other things like that, I mean, you know, Grammarly is an example mm. of, you know, like, I don't, uh, uh, my, my sense is that it's going to be less and less important to mm. know how to do all of that from, mm. the, from the absolute basics to the most complex. You just mm. don't need to have all of that knowledge. Yeah. 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 But it's a very interesting time. Uh, do you think it is a smart decision for designers to become multidisciplinary or do you see it as a more efficient to focus on becoming an expert in one discipline? Hmm. <laughs> I honestly think that comes down to the individual. Mm. Um, I'll tell you right now, for the last 30 or 40 years, the in Australia, it's it's been more lucrative and more important to be a generalist, industrial mm. designer. Um, same in Asia. I think Asia is very similar, is having a broad skill set that you can apply um, so that you can bring in more projects, right? Mm. 
So you could do a research focus project or a more technical focus project or mm. something that spans a whole, you know, the, they call the turnkey solution from start to finish, right? Mm. Um, so having all of those things is really um, important. And that's because the the industry is not, it's 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 big and it's it's you know we have a wealthy society in Australia, uh, and, a, and a and a big economy, but we have small to medium enterprises. Mm. We do not have large corporations, right? Whereas in Europe and the US, they still have the generalist designer, but they have way more opportunity to have specialists mm. because there are consultancies and companies that can, because they have medium to large enterprises as well as the small ones. Mm. Um, and large corporates, global corporates, um, they can subsist. They can have a whole career mm. working for a couple of big companies with projects, ongoing projects where you're a specialist. You're like, you're a, you know, human, you're, you're experience design specialist. You're a mm. visualization specialist. You are an ergonomic specialist. You are mm. a research specialist. And you communicate to others in the design team that are, you know, that's that are sprinkled throughout the process, but they're more, they're way more specialized. Mm. And that's just because the economy and the 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 vibrancy of design is such that it allows for that to happen. Um, but in terms of like at an individual level, it's it's just what you want. It's just mm. what you like. I mean, there are people who are built to be generalists. They're really good at being generalists. Um, and there's other people who are amazing at like specializing um and whatever you like i think you know you can find a, a job in that if you look hard enough mm. okay do you believe this is a result of current education uh wait yeah do you believe the need for um moving down either a specialist or a uh, more multidisciplinary path do you believe this is because of current education where we're integrated with other disciplines or do you think that the do you think that it's just it's just the nature of the of business at the moment and the way the world is operating it, it it's a bit of both mm. because as educators we try and we try and do two things is understand the pulse of what's going on in industry the local industry that our mm. students will potentially go in so we need to keep an eye on that but we also need to teach them for the future of that industry right so we need to um the, a really good way i like to describe it is you know when you go and work for a consultancy say i was still running my consultancy or uh greg mayer or rob gettys you know all these people that you see mm -hmm. they're fantastic at what they do but you know once you get to that position you are it, it, except for a very few number of people who are very flexible with their thinking up until they, you know, they're very old. You get stuck in certain ways of thinking mm. about how to do what you need to do. Right. And your job as a, as a, as a student is to, or my job as an educator is to teach students to push the envelope when you get out into the field, mm. right. Is to push the thinking of the establishment because they set the establishment. They're making decisions about what is, the current you know world of design what is it what are the frameworks how do we work within this world but but you realize you know they're like way older right mm. so they're stuck in the mindset of what they were when they were 20 30 in that in that but now they're making decisions about what it, and so students need to come in and 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 and, and push the boundaries they may need to shift it because that's the only way that a discipline progresses mm. because if all we're doing is teaching about how the industry is now, then the discipline never changes because it will always be stuck in the now. Do you get me? Like mm. I'll be teaching what you, what needs to be done now. Then the next, you will then grow up and think the same way as you know, what people did then, then we'll teach the same. It will always stay in that position mm. that you will never evolve. Whereas if we're teaching students to think outside the boundary and think outside the box, then they need to that that will slowly over time progress you know the field it will change it and evolve it mm. so going back to your question i know i've gone a roundabout way but going back to your question is as as educators and as as, as a teaching institution we should be very conscious about what's happening now mm. and teach for what's happening now but also in ways it's like put the seeds in for what the future might be mm. right 
and and um, so that they germinate, they cultivate into something different once mm. you're, you know, 10 years, 15 years down in your career. Um, so it's, it's, they feed off each other. Industry impacts what we do in education and we impact what industry does later on down the track because of that. Mm. So I can't tell you, I can't answer that question because it's like, it, it's, it's cycle. It continues, you know, in, impacting each other as time goes on. Um, so if I was to be just a bit more practical um, in my answer, I would say we in Australia teach a generalist designer. That, that's because the, the, many of our graduates will go into a, an industry which demands generalist, mm. you know, industrial designer. And, and in Europe and the US, there's a little bit more of like, you'll see courses that are defi- designed for a generalist designer, if you want, but also a specialist. Mm. They'll have like a master's in or a specialization in. They'll have many more of those, mm. you know, because they have specialists. There's a there's a field that will absorb that a little bit better. Mm. I suppose it's also in relation to population as well. Like they have a lot more people going through university so they can easily get enough numbers for some, you know, specialization courses, whereas it might be a bit more difficult in Australia where our numbers are a lot lower. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what key trends in design do you see as having the greatest effect on design education in the coming decade? You've already mentioned AI, which is always a buzzword in these podcasts. And um, I suppose it's because it's so prominent in the current world we are living in. I was thinking the other day, it's interesting, like I graduated end of last year. And when I graduated, chat GPT wasn't even a thing. And like, you're about to start again, you know, the new year, like, it's going to have such an impact on the new year and like your your job as a whole. Like, I know Rudy Turnitin has um made it they've released a ai detection um platform i'm pretty sure so they can detect oh, okay. I, I i love how i know about mm-hmm. this yeah i saw it somewhere the other day in like in reddit um yeah, yeah. they've released a way to, to detect ai um from chat gpt already but like obviously wow. it's not gonna work long term but um it's just interesting like yeah the difference from me last year to the new students next year is a massive difference here um some of the things I, some of the trends that I see, um, AI, of course. Mm. Um, so I need to, we need to stress because I think that has probably one of the biggest implications. Um, but I also think uh, things like um, robotics. Mm. So of course, AI has to do with that, but just the, the implications of robotics in things like the manufacturing world. I mean, I see a day in, day out with BMW in the medical health field. Um, in the social sphere, so in public, in the public realm, so public uh, uh, spaces and things like that, um, and in the private sphere, so um, in the home and, and, and things like that. So robotics is going to have a, mm. a, a big impact. Um, and robotics, not necessarily, you know, we're not going to just see it in like a humanoid robot. I'm talking robotics in non-humanoid robotics as well. Um, the other one is advanced materials Um, I think advanced materials is going to be um, really really important Um, and as some of those areas like artificial intelligence like 3D printing like um, microcomputing evolve and those things come together into the textiles and material space that's gonna. It, it, I, I can see in the in the near future. You know how as much as we talk about say AI or or metaverse, like these buzzwords, mm-hmm. there'll be a, a time when like advanced materials will just like <laughs> explode in terms yeah. of you know proliferation and application and all sorts of stuff. So, advanced materials is another one. Um. Well, the the metaverse and stuff for me is like it's in this like cusp of like it could go into nothingness. Mm. It's <laughs> or, almost like or, a meme at this point, but it it's is, so yeah. like kind of scaringly serious. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's really really interesting. You know, um, yeah, it's it's at this precipice of like either becoming absolutely nothing, flopping, or like becoming this thing that changes everything that we do in mm. so many fundamental ways. Um, you know, like. There's so many shows around that, like Peripheral and all these interesting kind of sci-fi shows where they envision these kinds of futures. So 
I don't know about that. Like I'm in, I'm in two minds um, mm. about the metaverse, VR, kind of, you know, the virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality type stuff. I don't know if there's some really interesting options and, and, mm. and, and futures for that. The final one I would say is, is energy production. Mm. Um, um, so, you know, it wasn't big news, but the, the there was um, in the US um, maybe about a month or two ago, they did the first ever um, properly recorded where they produce more energy out than energy in to in a in a in a, in a machine. Mm. Um, so it's not it, it it's not like it's not as crazy as it sounds. Like th- th- there's a conservation of energy throughout, but but basically there's like a new type of energy generation potential where you put in a little bit of energy and you can get more out in terms of kinetic energy to mm. use for machines for the world mm. around us. Um, you know, when you start thinking about those concepts, then it starts, you start to go, wow, imagine we didn't have to worry about energy for things. Mm. Like just that thought is yeah. mind boggling because everything we do, everything has to be about uh, where do we get that energy from? Mm. You you either buy it or you generate it or, you know, like to power the production of things, to power mm. the the cars that we use, to power the lights, to power the heating, to power like everything. Right? <laughs> Imagine if that was not a problem. Mm. That has fundamental basic implications for human nature. Mm. Um so yeah, I, that that's really interesting for, to me. I, I suppose this goes happen. back to like, you know, like the kind of the concept of the ocean as well with the um internet cables running under the ocean. Like it's almost like we're living in a world where foundationally we're living on ridiculously old principles of technology, but then we've got this kind of like mas- masquerade over the top of the world that's acting like we're super futuristic and we're living in the future, but really we're living in all these old principles and we're you know, running combustion engines, which were entered, which were created what like the early 1900s. We're running on internet cables under the ground. We've got, you know, we're, we're burning fossil fuels to power our vehicles. Like, I mean, our power our houses. Like, it's just all these old principles, you know, hidden by this futuristic aesthetic. And the, that's a really great way of saying it, um, Roman, because I think about you know the, you know, the battery tech, you know, mm. EVs and electronics uh, technology and stuff. It's like it is. It's just like, well, you realize right now, I'm not saying that it can't be better in the future, mm-hmm. but right now the way we're powering and generating energy for those is like archaic. It's just yeah. as bad as anything else that we've ever done. Yeah. But there's this kind of sheen of shiny beauty yeah. future tech on top of it, yeah. which is Adequate doing nothing. Like a futuristic vehicle. Yeah. 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 That's a really good way of, of kind of explaining that phenomenon. Yeah. Do you worry about algorithms such as ChatGPT and how they can affect university education and the need for education and how you educate and how students, you know, absorb the education and put out an output? In the long term, absolutely not. Mm. Uh, No. In the short term, yes, because I'm very conscious about, like, um, I want students to learn good stuff from me about how to be good thinkers, good learners, good, you know, professionals. Um, And if they're taking shortcuts to do that, then they're not learning that, Mm. you know? Um, And it's human nature to, to want to take shortcuts if they're available and they Mm. can't be caught. It's just human nature. So I do worry about that in the short term. I've seen like, you know, until we work out ways and methods to kind of utilize these as tools in our processes, which for me, that's all they are. They're just, it's mm. just another tool. Um, until we work out how to embed that into our processes, then it's going to be really tough for, for a group of students who will try and find the, you know, the, the path of least resistance to achieve passing or good grades or whatever. Mm. Um, they're going to utilize those and um, we're not going to be able to, to pick them up and, and, and help them, mm. you know, um, 
I can tell you right now, generally speaking, when I look across a classroom of, you know, 100 students, just to pick an easy number, 70 to 80% of them want to do, want to learn. Like they're, mm. they're, they, they want to learn properly. And yeah, they'll find roundabout ways and shortcuts here or there. But generally speaking, they're going to do the right thing um, for themselves, not for me as an educator, just for themselves. So it's those 20% that I'm really worried mm. about in the short term. Yeah. yeah. I think I think as well, when I look back, because I also did business as well, like for business, obviously this would be game changing. Like you could basically write your whole assignments in business. But um, for design, like your GPA your, doesn't really mean anything. Like I, I sometimes think I maybe spent like too much time worrying about that when I could have been using that energy to put into my own work. <clears throat> You know what I mean? Because like maybe in business, like your GPA makes it makes a difference, but in design, it really does not change much. It's it's ultimately like how good you are when you come out as a designer and things like that. And that's no, that and, way, and like yeah, and like can you imagine? You know, firstly, we don't do a lot of writing in design courses. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot of writing, but not like other fields where there mm -hmm. there's reports and stuff. Yeah. Um. So chat GPT is going to have maybe less of an impact mm. because it's, it's, you know, writing based, but say the Dali and others like that, that do the, the image generation stuff, right? Mm. Like you, you can't do a whole project on that. You know, like you, you, you can not be able to, to utilize a whole project. And, and even if you did and you got a great grade, it's like you're saying, it's like, who cares? You're going to yeah. be found out in five seconds, like in the real world. Mm. like you're not going to get away with it oh, can i get the cad file for that and you're like oh i don't have the cad file uh, yeah i don't know like it's going to take mm. an instant to to be found out so yeah it you know like i said in the long term i it doesn't it's just another tool yeah i think that's a good way to look at it from my time at university right uh, with technology such as VR slash AR, you already mentioned this to some degree, um, becoming more prominent. Do you see metaverse-like studying environment becoming the norm? Uh, for example, I can say over COVID, this kind of thing would have been really good. I lost out on a lot of, you know, the experience of learning from people. Like I can say my last year was probably my best year at QT because we, you know, we had that in-person interaction and you learn a lot more from your peers. Like even relationships, I didn't really have any friends that i would say like i still talk to um that i would that what I, that I would still talk to if i did degree all the way to the end through online because like you don't really i mean you know how they're like oh you can do your um you know go into your breakout room and chat and you know it's, it, it's not the same like you can't realistically you can't do anything like that. but yeah do you think no. if something like that was implemented would it have had a good effect and do you see that as maybe the evolution of um, education in the future I 100% think that we will still have face-to-face -face in much of what we do in design. Mm. Um, I think things like the metaverse where they might replicate some sort of human-to-human -human interaction, um, but in the virtual world, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as a bad thing, fundamentally. It's a good thing, um, but more for very... For, for very specific cases as well as like for specific types of learning hmm. um because a lot of what we do in design you need to sit in front of someone in the re you know face to face to to learn and to to get that energy and to get that understanding of of how things work and and, and to to learn better and all of that um but there are some skill sets and techniques and things you can teach online or in the kind of metaverse type environment, which I think would actually benefit from being on there. Mm -hmm. um, but they're probably not a lot, right? There's yeah. a few. But the other thing that I think the metaverse might really be helpful for is to provide access to people that traditionally might not have had access to education mm. at that level. So to people who, you know, remote or who have health conditions that don't allow them to travel mm. or to... Um, you know, to to have have cognitive disabilities or other types of disabilities, where this allows them to engage in a certain way, so so it opens up the access to mm. to certain gr user groups that traditionally might have really really struggled to get the same access as um, you know um, others. Mm. 
I think that's that's a really great area and that's a really good outcome of of potentially what we might have with virtual teaching and education and stuff in in the future yeah um but i i i I don't think my gut feeling is that we're never going to be able to go into kind of a virtual no matter how much it tries to replicate the real world it will never fully go towards Mm. that and there will always be some sort of experience lost to the detriment of it 100 percent. yeah yeah that's my feeling on it as well uh, from my time at university, one limitation I found was the lack of collaboration between design and engineering students. So at QT, there's such a large um, section of engineering and, you know, we have a very, very big reliance on that um, throughout the campus. And I think it would be really interesting if we had had that kind of, you know, together interaction, because when you're in the real world, uh, you kind of get a lot of situations where you, well, I mean, from my experience so far, I found that I had to interact with engineers and I had to you know, learn how to interact with them, um, collaborate with them and find ways to work together to come to that goal of not just a practical, um, not not just the design solution, but do it in a way that's efficient and, you know, follows the engineering principles. Um, basically, yeah, do you see that as something that maybe will change in the future? Um, definitely. I agree with you. I think one way that it's been tackled and it's been tried, it's tried to be tackled is the double degrees. Mm. And so rather than having an industrial design cohort and engineering cohort over here and developing projects that collaborate is the student is the one who's doing both. And Mm. you'll see a lot like that's, that's exploded. So half of our cohort is a double degree student. Mm. So that was nowhere near we had maybe 10 15 percent at most that were trying to do two degrees previously and some there were versions of the course where you couldn't even do a double degree yeah right so um so i think that's one way to tackle it the other thing to think about is um so it's not just engineering it's actually lots of other fields Mm. because design and the way design is evolving as a as a discipline, I'm not talking about just industrial design now, but design, um, which industrial designers obviously play a role in industrial design, but there's lots of graduates who go into related, you know, mm. affiliated design fields. Um, so design is becoming far more broader, and it's in the in the interaction between design and and some other discipline where the new stuff is emerging. So for instance, biomed and design, Mm. right. Or, or material science and design or mathematics and design. Mm. Um, It's in those areas where those clash, where the new stuff is happening in in terms of the future professions that will evolve. Um, I'm not saying they, that we're going to have like, wherever two things combined is going to be a new profession that's mm-hmm. not necessarily the case but but by allowing them to combine you allow the the chance for something new to 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 form mm. so thinking about like the future the old traditional industrial design is certainly engineer with designer right that 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 intersection is like really important and maybe you know business and design and there was a few right of those things in the future it's it's a there's a lot of differences there's a lot of unique ways that designers are going to be working with all sorts of different professionals mm. and new new kind of evolving professions are going to emerge as a result of that so it's 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 not just engineering i think we're going to have to do that with lots of other fields mm. okay what skills do you see as being the most important for designers to learn to stay relevant in the coming years Um, I think for me, it's because of the type of companies and industry collaborators that I work with, like BMW, like TTI and another, another big corporates and even smaller ones, but it always starts at the big corporates and then filters mm. down into medium and then filters down into the smaller. Uh, it's really abstract, the things that I think are really important. And I, yeah. I'll try and explain it in briefly. 
you know, talking about the future of design and 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 the, the challenges that we have in front of us to solve the big problems that we have, you know, mm. um, poverty, inequality, economic issues, um, responding to, you know, natural disasters, um, environmental stuff, all of those things. These are big, complex problems. So uh, for me, it's about designers getting better at engaging with those kinds of problems. So mm. things like system thinking is really critical, right? Things like um, being comfortable with ambiguous problems, right? And again, like I said, I'm very conscious that it sounds really like it's not, not technical stuff, right? Yeah. Like not hard skills that mm. I'm talking about, but if we're going to solve the problems we need to solve, these are the things you need to be good at, right? As thinkers, like the hard stuff, um, which is thinking, changing minds, and then how people think. So systems thinking, being comfortable with ambiguity, creativity, like, okay, now that we've, okay, I'm comfortable with ambiguity, I'm, I'm comfortable with really complex problems. The, the other really important kind of um, ingredient you need is to be, left field thinker creative thinker because mm. existing thinking processes are not going to be good enough for the problems we have that we've never faced before you know mm. um so creativity is really important um um understanding like algorithms and things like that like understanding Base. I'm not saying you need to be a mathematician, but understanding how those things work mm. are going to become more and more important in all sorts of fields. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Those th those are some of the problems that I think are are, are really really important. Um, cross collaboration, like, but I think that's been happening for some time now. Like, I don't think designers have too much of a problem with that they, they, you kind of get thrown in to do that mm. in education now like it's kind of really common where you work with other disciplines early on and later on um but working with others is going to be really important because that's the only way we're going to solve these big problems you mm. know it's not going to be just the designer going oh here's my the solution it's going to be a team of people from all sorts of different fields you know mm. working together so it does that, seem as well like in the past governments look to more practical people like lawyers and and um, maybe even economists and people like that to solve the world's problems. Whereas now I feel like design, as design becomes more prominent in the world, I would hope, but I maybe estimate as well that governments will start looking towards designers for, you know, help with complex systems and help to improve the world of the future. And yeah, I definitely feel like you can see that already. Like you guys have initiatives with the government um that you're working on as far as i know it's still going on and yeah, yeah that just shows that the government does like see the value of designers and that they want to um yeah bring about that kind of thing yeah look there's lots of countries around the world where designers sit at the political level um in singapore in in um uh you know places like the nordic countries a lot of them have designers or design thinkers, design strategists that sit at the kind of, you know, um, cabinet level of mm. governments. Um, so yes, it's changing slowly, but yeah, I agree with what you've just said. I think yep. that's important. Okay. In design, we implement dated yet nonetheless important skills such as sketching, research, manufacturing, preparation, visualization, etc. As we integrate with AI and other prominent technologies, do you see these fundamental skills changing or adapting, or do you see them staying the same? Um, I might just mention that we'll need to wrap up in about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. um, um, it's a really tricky space, and I'll, I'll try and explain, because I don't think we unpack this at university enough for students. The act of drawing, right, analogs, mm. or the act of making prototypes with your hands is not just to teach you the skills of drawing with your hands and making with your hands. Mm. It's not just about that. Of course, you learn 
the muscle memory and techniques and things of doing that as you do it, as you perform those activities. But there's something much more important that it does. Mm. And that is it rewires your brain or it hardwires your brain in a certain way. Okay. And there's lot there's studies that have looked at this and they're established. So getting you guys saying first year to just sketch for your projects is not just because we want to be hard asses and mm. you know, like get you to oh use this old tech to do this. It's not just that, right? Mm. Of course it's important to learn how to sketch because you don't always have a computer and it's all, it's important to, you know, to be able to communicate in mm. that format. Um, but the hand eye coordination, the process of sketching, mm. the, the randomness of the line as you're drawing and how that impacts your brain as you're looking at it. And then how that your brain then tells your hand to do something else that back and forth, that, in, that whole mm. feedback, uh, feed forward feedback, interaction that's happening with your body the mind and the paper is changing how you think mm. right it's forming a new pathways in your brain and creating new pathways for your neurons and what what hasn't been established in science yet but what we think is happening is that why are designers more creative and can think more left field or why can designers think about systems better than other fields, right? Mm. Um, not not all of them, but but like a bell curve, more of them think in, in different ways than others. The assumption is that it's because of those things that we do. We train you in certain ways. And because we train you in certain ways, you're forming different ways of thinking about the world mm. and different ways of thinking about the world then impact you later on down your life. Right. Mm. So I'll give you an example, you know, like in industrial design, we, we tell you to start sketching products in different views and you have to think about it in like side view, side profile, this profile, this profile and upside down and do, looking down or looking really close or looking. Mm. It's not just for the sake of like getting you to sketch and you know do work and build up that skill set but it's also because when we're talking more sophisticated stuff down the line about systems and understanding things you know systems are like a network like a spider web but in three dimensions right? yeah. and so now when we talk about systems you your brain can already do this mental acrobatics of think about things floating in the world and rotating and moving mm. you are just now more attuned to being able to do that than someone who has never had to have to think about that you know mm. like we think in three dimensions from like day one yeah right and so systems when we're talking about say systems thinking or these more complex stuff you've now got your brain is like already in that mode and able to switch between like these different modes to be able to go, oh yeah, like I can think of it this way and think of it that way. And now I can look at the system from this perspective and think, oh, how does that impact that? You know, that the user over here and da da da. So if if we all of a sudden just go, oh, there's a new tool to to sketch, and let's just forget about sketching. You don't need to sketch anymore. Mm. Then we're now impacting these things yeah. that are really important for generating how you think as a designer mm. um because that 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 process of that technique of drawing or making or catting or whatever is not just for the sake of doing it it's not just for the technical skill sets that you learn mm. it's also got to do with like teaching you how to think a certain way and teaching your brain how to think a certain way yeah definitely so if we were just to lose that that would be a massive change to yeah how we what kind of designers we put out into the world mm, definitely yeah i think that's definitely true like when you even think about the early years of cad they kind of kind of eliminated the need for hand you know um drafting of technical specifications things like that but like obviously that wasn't particularly needed because cad replaced that and you didn't really you know there was no need for doing it on paper anymore but i think you're right like sketching is just one of those things where it's timeless like it's not going to if you evolve, even even digital sketching, I found I went back to analog and I'm been enjoying it far more because 
like you lose something with the digital sketching. Yep. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just to finish off, what advice yep. would you give to graduates like myself looking for their first ID position? <laughs> um, it's pretty simple. And I always try and think of something more sophisticated or more, but it's it, I always come back to this. It's follow your passion. Mm. Follow what you love doing in design. Um, and if it's not design, then follow that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, the reason why I say that is uh, if you if you follow your passion, you'll find the job that excites you and you'll you'll end up, I think, in most cases, earning, you know, everyone's after a certain, you know, lifestyle and comfort in their kind of, you know, in the way they earn um, for their career. You will find that balance mm. between like, oh, sh you, you kind of wake up, if you do what you love, you kind of wake up and you go, you kind of tell yourself this weird secret of, I can't believe someone's paying me to do this. Like, and no matter what they're paying you, you're kind of going, oh my God, someone's going to find out like <laughs> that I actually love it. And, and there's this weird thing of like, I shouldn't love what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but yes, you should, right? Yeah. Because cause then you wake up and you have like a drive, a passion, you have this energy for it. Mm -hmm. And so you'll keep getting better and better at it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I've tried to come up with a more complex way of saying it, but it's like, it's that basic. Yeah. Um, now, I will mention, obviously, there's the like, um, you know, I always jump around between this kind of theoretical thinking of it and the practical element of like, you need to earn money, mm. right? And there's times when you're going to be doing a job that you probably don't like, but you just need to do it because you need to make mm. ends meet. You need to pay that loan. You need to have a roof over your head and food and stuff. And I get that. That's And if you have to do that, then you have to do that, right? Mm. But always think long-term. It's like, all right, when can I get out of this into something else? Like, well, mm. I'm looking for those opportunities when I can maybe shift into something that's a little bit more of my what I like. Mm. But don't get stuck doing, because no matter how much you get paid, seriously, no matter how much money you get given to do something, if you hate it, you're going to have a miserable life. Yeah. you're going to have an absolutely miserable life mm. um, and you can have all the money in the world a room full of cash and it's not going to make a lick of difference mm. um, and so chase the passion with the understanding that sometimes you're going to have to maybe go backwards to go forwards sometimes you're going to have to do jobs that you probably don't like you might have to you know you might be in between jobs and you have to go and work in retail mm okay don't don't like crumble under that kind of change mm. it's gonna it might happen you know not everyone gets the luxury of finding their dream job straight away mm. um actually very few people do but if you keep chasing that path towards mm. your passion firstly you'll end up there and secondly you will look back and you'll be like bloody hell i enjoyed that journey like i really enjoyed it and That's here i am you doing get it this straight away you don't respect what you get as much as if you actually work and you yes. work towards it and you, you finally achieve it. Yeah. That is, that's really true. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. Well, yeah. Thank you, Raf, for coming on the podcast. And I'm sure your insights will be very amazing for the people who listen. And I hope to have you back on soon. Yeah, no, I look forward to it. And thanks again, Roman. Thank you, Appreciate Raph. it. Talk to you soon. Cheers.